Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the Director of the Institute for Government. We're delighted to be having this event, and there has been such a buzz about it. We are uh, more subscribed for this uh, than for many, many of our, our immensely popular events for months. So thank you all very much for coming, and thank you to our panel and to the British Academy for doing that with us. We, um, very, we've been very keen on this event for a long time. It draws on the, um, our sense of the history of Whitehall, a project that Dr. Kath Haddon has been working on for a long time, about the lessons we should learn from our past, and about the need for a cabinet office that works in kind of coordinating uh, government and pulling it together. It is, I, I, I think, um, an extraordinary thing to reflect on, that there wasn't such an organization until, um, in, until the middle of the First World War, the centenary that we're now celebrating. Anyway, we are delighted to be joined uh, by Sir Jeremy Hayward, who is going to be chairing this uh, very interesting discussion, and Lords Armstrong, Butler, Wilson, Turnbull, and O'Donnell, with their particular reflections. I'm going to hand over right now to Alan Evans of the British Academy to say a few words about their particular interest in this, and then to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a very great privilege for me on behalf of the British Academy, of which I'm Chief Executive, to welcome you here as a co-sponsor with the Institute for Government. Uh, having spent 32 years in the civil service before I became Chief Executive of the British Academy, it's uh, been a great privilege to actually work for all six of these uh, uh, cabinet sectors, one way and another. Uh, the British Academy, for those of you who don't know, is the National Academy supporting the humanities and social sciences. So just as the uh, Royal Society promotes science, uh, we promote the importance of the humanities and social sciences to understanding all the challenges facing Britain today and all of the most complex challenges from productivity to climate change to aging to obesity etc all rely on the need for input from all of the academic disciplines in particular the humanities and social sciences and of course the biggest challenge at the moment facing the country in terms of Brexit will not in my view be solved by science and technology and engineering but by an understanding of economics, politics, history, philosophy, international relations, international law, and so on, which is uh, one of the reasons why we in the British Academy are very keen to put the expertise of our fellowship at the disposal of government or anyone else. Um, it also gives me a great pleasure to welcome uh, you to this event today because I strongly believe, and the Academy strongly believes, in the importance of history and learning from the lessons of history because one of the things that history teaches us is that history can repeat itself. And so people who have knowledge and insight into the way in which history works and actually have a, um, a, a culture of uh, learning from the past and uh, ensuring that um, we learn those lessons seems to me very important, which is why it's a great privilege, privilege to be introducing this event. I checked out on that most um, reliable source of uh, information, Wikipedia, uh, how many uh, years experience there is represented on the platform of the civil service, and I made it 209 years jointly. So um, hopefully that will be able to inform some of our discussion. And on, on a personal note of the six uh, members on the panel, I have played cricket with 50% of them, which is also something I'm very, very proud of, but I'll leave you to judge which 50% um, which, uh, that was. So enjoy the afternoon. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic event. And over to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, on behalf of uh, the surviving cabinet secretaries and myself, thank you very much for this event. Um, I'm going to do my best to keep some discipline over the next hour before we hand it over to you for questions, and we'll try and have some sort of structured conversation. Um, and I wanted to start, really, uh, by asking uh, Robert, uh, oldest member, uh, for any reflections he has on some of the five cabinet secretaries who aren't with us today because they've died. Um, but there were 11 of us in total, six of us surviving, five uh, have passed away. Uh, and Robert, you might want to start with uh, any observations on any of those former colleagues uh, that you worked with. Well, I didn't know Hankey, uh, the, the first, and of course who did 22 years, and uh, was the first, first person to sit on the Prime Minister's right in the, uh, the, the, when the Cabinet met at number 10. Um, I remember when I became Cabinet Secretary, somebody said, where does Robert sit? And uh, they said, does he sit behind the Prime Minister, behind Margaret Thatcher? No, they said, he sits at the table on Margaret Thatcher's right. God, they said, we didn't know there was such a place. <laughs> I, I did know Bridge, Edward Bridges, uh, 
though not when he was cabinet secretary, when he was permanent secretary of the treasury, my first permanent secretary. Uh, 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 but uh, of course, when I became cabinet secretary, I looked back at, uh, at the, my predecessors. And I think that it was he really who established the cabinet system, the cabinet office system, the cabinet government system, in it, more or less in its present form. Maurice Hankey had obviously started it, started the actual business of cabinet secretariat, the writing of minutes, circulating of agenda and all that. But uh, Edward Bridges, who became cabinet secretary in 1938, coped with the war. The cabinet committees developed the cabinet committee system, developed the style of cabinet minutes, which I think we've all since followed, uh, the great merit of which is that though the discussion is recorded faithfully, nothing is attributed to anybody except the Prime Minister and one minister, so that nobody is going to come back and say to you, you, you have misreported what I said. Um, so that I, th I think his, his foundations, as it were, he bu building on Han Hankey's foundations, it was he who really started, really created the Cabinet Office and the cabinet government system as, as we now have it. It's, a lot has been built on it since and we shall come to that. But uh, I, I, do, I do remember him. He was a lovely man and a great man. Um, uh, I have many stories of him when he was in the treasury. Um, I remember him when he was not very well and on, the, on his door he pinned a note saying, please do not ask me how I am. I will tell you when I'm about, about to die, or I am, be or I am better, signed E. E. B. He was a very direct person. Um, so, so that I, 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 I certainly look back to him as the, as the uh, really, in a sense, the creator of the system, which has developed so much from that since that time. Um, I served under Bur Burke Trend in the Cabinet Office for a couple of years, 64 to 66, so I got to know him very well. Um, and I think both he and I look back at Bridges as a kind of mentor uh, from our days with him in the Treasury. Marvellous, thank you very much. Robin, anything you want to add to this? Well, um, just briefly, I, I did meet Brooke um, as when I first went into the Treasury as uh, an assistant principal, as a sort of laying on of hands. Curiously, I, He's a, he had an office in the Treasury. I don't know whether he had an office in the Cabinet Office as well, but I remember meeting him in the, uh, in the Treasury. But I didn't know him. Um, I worked in the Cabinet Office in the CPRS, the think tank, when Burke Trend was uh, Cabinet Secretary, and there was a certain amount of tension, really, about the role of the CPRS between um, Trend and uh, Rothschild. Uh, and I remember um, Trend as a very ascetic figure. I remember doing a great faux pas by going into the uh, cabinet office mess and seeing there was one empty table in the corner and going and sitting on it. And uh, <laughs> Burke Trend arrived and uh, he didn't ask me to leave. He, as he thought, and as he no doubt intended, tried to put me at my ease, which, uh, <laughs> which he didn't succeed in doing. <laughs> Fine, okay, well, moving on. Um, I thought I'd next ask uh, the panel members to uh, tell us about their thoughts about how you best prepare to become Cabinet Secretary. What are the career, what is the normal, if there is such a thing, career path that takes you from uh, junior ranks in the civil service to uh, the eminence uh, at the top of the pinnacle? Uh, Andrew, why don't you kick well, off on this I one? I thought my preparation was just about <coughs> ideal, really. I spent a lot of time in the Treasury of various divisions, and then I've spent three, had three spells in the centre, once as the economic private secretary number 10, went back to the Treasury, then came back as the principal private secretary. Then, uh, unusually, because uh, Treasury people usually play fire and forget with their people they send off to departments, I went off to the Department of the Environment after Richard followed Michael Howard to the Home Office. Um, then came back to the Treasury and then came back as Cabinet Secretary. And so I, with one short spell over in the, the IMF, and I, I couldn't really have planned it any better, I think. Uh, Richard, uh, you're unusual not having been yes. uh, a Treasury person or having been a private session number 10, I think. I but think I have those strengths, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I 
I think you're right. I think I have. Um, I, I, I am the outsider in terms of, uh, of my career. I did serve in the Cabinet Office for two years on the assessment staff in the um, early 70s, which is absolutely invaluable and fascinating. Um, but other than that, I was in the Board of Trade when we were the uh, trade negotiating department uh, on the Kennedy Round. Uh, very strong I'm going to department. be hiring him later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was in the Department of Energy for 13 years. Um, I applied for a private sector in number 10 uh, and um, was told to wait for an interview, but I never got, I had a haircut, which is a big thing in the 70s, um, waited but never got called and inquired and was told it had gone to Nigel Wicks and sorry they'd forgotten to tell me that I wasn't going to be interviewed. Uh, that's so it felt, uh, and I, uh, I worked with some of my colleagues here, um, as it were as a line finance man in um, departments. I remember Robin uh, energetically telling us about something called Fizz. Do you remember Fizz, Robin? Yeah, and we all were summoned in to be told. I remember Andrew, uh, 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 yes, um, supervising my public expenditure, being a spending man. So on, um, and then I got called in by Robert um, and uh, appointed head of the Economic and Domestic Secretariat, which was a big break under Margaret Thatcher for three years. Thank you, Robert, uh, which was absolutely crucial. Uh, and then Robin, uh, and then under Robin too, who was very generous, uh, let me, gave me a lot of latitude. And uh, Robin then said to me, uh, I think it's about time you've had a spell in the Treasury. I'll never forget that conversation. We, we need you to be more of a Treasury man. Uh, and I went to the Treasury for two years. It was a kind of um, finishing school, really, uh, before, <laughs> before I became Permanent Secretary of the Environment and then the Home Office and then um, for three years, four years, uh, and then Cabinet Secretary for five. So it's a, it, and the answer is, if you have a career which gets you to the Cabinet Secretary, without being in the Treasury much, you know what it's like being in the line dealing with the Treasury and you know how departments work and I found that really very important in terms of working in the Secretariat of the Cabinet Office and being Cabinet Secretary. It altered the way I saw the job. I, uh, and that's my answer, I think. Brilliant. And Gus, you ended up as Treasury Permanent Secretary but you took an unusual route to getting there, from <laughs> economics to the press. Yeah. So, so well, I was, yeah. story. Academic in the 1970s, where we definitely didn't do haircuts, right? Um, and then, uh, then came into Treasury as a kind of economist, sort of specialist, uh, spent some time in, in the States. But when I look back on it, the big break for me was um, being made press secretary to Nigel Lawson, uh, which was a, such a brilliant triumph that within weeks he'd resigned, fallen out, with, <laughs> fallen out with Margaret Thatcher, if I remember rightly, and it, quite a lot of people fell at the same time. And... Um, but that was, and I got to work with Robin, uh, might come on to some of the things that happened jointly with us uh, during that John Major presidency, uh, prime ministership. So, so that was, that was uh, I thought that was good and gave me my time in, in number 10. And then being in the foreign office, working in a, an embassy abroad, I thought was, was uh, extremely useful. Uh, the big gap was not being in a uh, spending department uh, at any time, and that would have been very useful and would have learnt more on the operational side. So you have to try and make up for that in other ways. But um, certainly, I'd say uh, understanding the Treasury uh, is, is an important part of it, but, but seeing it from the other side as well is crucial. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's move on. The role of the Cabinet Secretary, I think, has evolved over time. And I, I gave a presentation to this, uh, to the IFG, um, a year or so ago, in which I tried to sort of carve out my time. And it'd be just very interesting to see uh, how, how I spent my time as Cabinet Secretary is different from how, for example, Robert would have spent his. And I, from memory, had about 40% of my time on civil service management and managing the permanent secretaries. Uh, and that's got a very big slug of my time, maybe about 10% directly on cabinet business, cabinet committees, uh, doing the cabinet minutes and sitting with the Prime Minister in cabinet. Uh, but a large chunk of my time doing external representation, but above all doing sort of policy advice and, uh, and so on. So that was a rough sort of uh, snapshot of what I was spending my time on last year and it hasn't changed that much, I would say. Robert, thinking back, how, what proportion of your time did you spend on managing the civil service? Because you were, I think, head of the civil service at the same time. Uh, what, what percentage on pure cabinet business or cabinet committee business? Or did you spend more time on intelligence and foreign policy? Well, I started in, in 79 uh, 
just as Secretary of the Cabinet, and I was not head of the civil service at that stage. So at, at that time, my, uh, for those years, my time was really devoted mo mostly to the servicing of the Cabinet and Cabinet committees and advising the Prime Minister for the purpose of br briefing meetings, going with her in some meetings. I did do one job which I think the rest of us did not do, and that was to be the Prime Minister's Sherpa for G7 economic summits. Um, and though that involved not merely attending the summit, but uh, three or four preliminary meetings with the Sherpas from the other seven countries uh, and, and from the European community, as it then was, um, in, in various pleasurable spots around the world, depending on which country happened to be in the chair that year. Um, and that was quite that was quite demanding because apart from the expenditure of time there was a good deal of drafting and exchange of papers with my seven colleagues ab abroad um, then that be that began to ch change uh, in 1981 when the civil service department was abolished and its functions were divided between the treasury and the cabinet office and I became first joint head and then sole head. I, I was joint head of the civil service from 1981 to 83, the other joint head being Douglas Wass, who was the permanent secretary <coughs> of the treasury. And then Douglas retired, and I was uh, suggested to the prime minister that his successor <coughs> should become joint head of the, part of the civil service. And she said, no, Robert, I can't have a pinky and perky arrangement. You'll have, <laughs> you'll have to do it yourself. Um, and so then, uh, I suppose about, uh, I suppose about 20 to 25 percent of my time would have been spent on civil service matters. And in order to make room for that, I changed the practice of my predecessors. My predecessors had uh, insisted that every document that went to the prime minister went over their signatures. Even if it was drafted down the department, it was redone and sent to number 10 over the cabinet secretary's signature. Um, I came to the conclusion that uh, in order to make room for this civil service work, I shouldn't try to do that. So I, with the Prime Minister's agreement, uh, I arranged that the deputy secretaries of the various secretariats in number 10 would put up their put up briefs and documents to the Prime Minister on their own responsibility, sending copies to me so that I could uh, amend them uh, or su make make su supplementary suggestions if I felt the need to do so, and that uh, that made room to to do the to the, the duties of the head of the civil service. I don't think I did them as thoroughly as Robin and probably. His successors did. Um, I was able to do rather less visiting of other, other, other departments and other civil service enterprises. I did do a certain amount of visiting and I went to various departments including the Scottish office in Edinburgh. But uh, I'm conscious that I didn't, wasn't able to get around as much as I think that Robin Butler certainly did. Interesting. Gus, you, uh, when you did the job you had three jobs. Uh, cabinet office permanent secretary as well. Do you want to take yes, us through? I think the point I get across is that the, the different splits uh, changes through time. So with Tony Blair as Prime Minister, big emphasis on modernisation of public services, big emphasis on getting out there, understanding what the blockages were, how you could improve public services, and in those days how you could spend more money uh, to achieve better outcomes. And as it evolved and we went through the cuts exercise, I remember going through and saying, how are you going to spend uh, fewer resources and getting better outcomes? So it, it kind of changed. And the, the latter, obviously, much harder and meant that you, know, you needed to go and talk to people face-to-face uh, -face around the country, trying to empathise with a system where you were cutting their exit payments, cutting their pensions, reducing their real pay and all those sorts of things and trying to motivate them to inspire them to produce better services for the public. So I think that was quite big. But then coalition, suddenly, uh, 
you're into doing a lot of very Whitehall based. You're into very classic cabinet secretary setting up the cabinet committee system, trying to make sure it works, trying to and this new beast that you're not really sure it, if it will ever fly, and making sure that you're taking away any obstacles. So yeah. it, it, it varies, varies through time. time. Yeah, Robin, how about you? Well, I think the point I'd like to get to make, and I don't know whether the others would agree. Um, I, I think people might be surprised about how little actual secretarying I did. Um, you know, I went to, lot of, went to the uh, cabinet. Um, in latter days, the cabinet didn't do anything really, so you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't do, do much. I didn't do cabinet committees unless it was a sort of war cabinet or um, something like that. And the thing, I, the other thing I'd like to get across is um, stuff happens and takes an awful lot of time. I mean, for example, the Scott inquiry uh, took me a lot of time. The misbehaviour of ministers took me uh, a lot of time. <laughs> and um, I always used to think, you know, when I got that black box in the evening, I opened it with the greatest uh, enthusiasm. It was like a brand tub, you know, there were wonderful uh, things in it. And uh, I, I, I always enjoyed it, and it was hugely varied. But as Robert said, I mean, I... I we had to implement the, the um, next steps, which Peter Kemp did most of the heavy lifting on, but I did spend a lot of time on uh, going around to the civil service, using the time which Robert would have used on going away with the Prime Minister and Sherping. I saved that time. And I think the other thing I'd say is, you know, people say, well, being head of the civil service as well as cabinet secretary is much too big a job um, for anybody. It's really not. Um, as long as you can make room out of the uh, <laughs> out of the rest for a bit of representational uh, work, and you've got some good lieutenants, it's perfectly possible to uh, unite the two effectively. And I think it works much better in the interests of both the prime minister and the civil service if these two posts are united, as they have been recently. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, do you do much secretary? I think. Um, well, the secretariats themselves didn't take a lot of time. You, a new prime minister comes in, the first thing you do is you sort out titles, you sort out the seating plan, and you sort out the houses. Um, and then you sort out the, the, the committee structure, which either gets used or, or, or not used. The actual attendance at meetings, I didn't go to a lot of cabinet committee meetings uh, themselves. I spent a lot of time inside coordinating all the bits and pieces of the cabinet office, the various units, um, the secretariat as a DIRI unit, OPSR while it existed, um, the, whatever the, it was called, the, it was the office of the e-envoy, um, the strategy unit, the PIU, and as John Bird joked, there was the social exclusion unit for people who couldn't find a place in one of the other units. <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a lot of problem, there were problem solving at the Foundation Hospital at Rao. Yeah, I was asked to kind of uh, deal with that. And then there was one of the most acrimonious rows White I've ever seen in the blue corner being Rachel Lomax and in the other corner Michael Bichard <laughs> arguing ferociously about who should have the benefits system and out of that came uh, DWP, which I think has been uh, a lasting and uh, good development. The other thing I spent time on, surprisingly, was uh, reshuffles and machinery of government. Some of this, the machinery of government, uh, in, under this general heading of improving professionalisation of all the things other than policy, which we've always prided ourselves on, Office of Government, Commerce, Shareholder Executive, Partnerships UK, Office of the E-Envoy, the communications function, getting those set up uh, and properly headed and uh, properly uh, uh, resourced. Um, so also, quite a amount of time on the management of the civil service, the SASC process, Senior Appointments Selection Committee, maybe call something else now. Succession planning, uh, so a lot of time interviewing people for posts. Because the, the idea that you simply named someone had long since gone, so people applied for jobs and you had to go through a proper process of sifting and interviewing and assessing. Um, and the same for a number of public appointments um, as well. And then, of course, there's always uh, the propriety ethics, civil service code, ministerial code, uh, relations with the PASC, or whatever it's now called now. Um, there's, there's maybe it's 10% of your time, but it was actually quite important work that no one else was doing. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Richard? I think about 30-40% um, of the time was very much on management of the civil service. I did a lot of visits. I did about 100 speeches a year. Um, and um, to, to civil service audiences mainly. Uh, and um, of course the drive for delivery and modernization was very strong. We had this, the Make It Different campaign with amazing events for 500 people up and down the country. Some of you, perhaps you're too, too young, uh, we, we, we went to, to try to get across the message that we um, had to do more focus on outcomes and less on policy advice. But the um, a record. We've, Ian Beasley's been doing an analysis of the official history of my, how I use my time. And the thing that he's drawn out was that I had very sh few periods when I was free from some sort of crisis or emergency or another. Mm -hmm. If you look at the number of military actions, the first um, Iraq bombing, followed by um, Kosovo, followed by Sierra Leone, followed by Afghanistan, where we had a huge number of ministerial meetings. Mm. Uh, that, and if you add to that 9-11, and if you add to that other crises, like the foot and mouth um, crisis, where Mr. Blair called me after he really got out of control with a month at 8.30, and um, you may have been there, and said, um, I want you to take control. <laughs> oh, thank you. Me and whose army? Well, actually, we used the army. Um, uh, 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 and of course the fuel protest in, uh, when uh, less than 100 people uh, armed only with mobile phones brought the economy in near as damn it to a complete halt in four and a half working days, uh, which you, you remember, David Amand. Um, th th if you add all those up, there are very few smooth patches when I was left, to, uh, as it were, to do the day job. Uh, and if you add to that the machinery of government changes which we did in, before it, the election in 2001, which are the biggest, I think, had been done for many years. Um, and that took months and months of preparation. And, and, and all the other troubleshooting, which is included ministers um, and, and so on. Uh, I, think, I think it's quite hard to generalise, but you have a large slug of management and then a lot of crises, and then, of course, the secretariat functions, as Robin said, they weren't quite as intense under Mr. Blair as they had been, say, under Mrs. Thatcher. Well, I think the striking thing is how little the job has changed over time, actually. I mean, it does vary, as Gus said, from uh, period to period, from prime minister to prime minister, phase to phase. But fundamentally, it's the same mix in different proportions of being the trusted advisor, being the investigator behind the scenes, uh, advising on machinery of government, being the, uh, the official note taker, uh, all those things as well as leading the civil service. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really quite striking. I think, from... it's, I think it's fair, to, the, the point you've just made, that the, even the, the content of the job, but some of the way in which you do it, changes from one prime minister to another. Mm. The, the, the personal relationship which you have, above all with the prime minister, but with the prime minister's colleagues, um, it, it, it does, goes far to determine how you're going to spend your time and your relationship with that Prime Minister, what that Prime Minister wants from you or needs from you. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I think is perhaps I am the only uh, former Cabinet Secretary here who never had anything on his desk but a telephone. Uh, and not a mobile one at that. Certainly true at the moment. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, several of you have reminded us that stuff, stuff happens, we have crises. So let's just take a little minute to uh, reflect on the various crises that you've each had to, to deal with over the, the time you were uh, in office. Robin, why don't you kick this one off? What was your, fa what was your favorite crisis? <laughs> well, I think the thing I got most satisfaction from, really, was the first Gulf War, um, where, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, Kuwait, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Um, Margaret Thatcher resigned halfway through, and we went to war on the in January. But um, it, it very often happened that these uncivilized people did things during August, <laughs> and uh, that Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait during August. Margaret Thatcher was uh, due to go off on holiday. I cancelled, I cancelled the first week, well she went to Aspen, Colorado, didn't she, do you remember, and said uh, no time to go floppy George. And, um, and anyway, I cancelled the first bit of my holiday to set up the machinery uh, 
for servicing military action um, uh, if and when it happened. And uh, we, we put all the machinery in place of um, the assessment staff meeting at 4.30 in the morning, the JIC meeting at 6 in the morning, permanent secretaries meeting at a more civilised time at 8 in the morning, <laughs> going back to their departments, briefing their ministers, ministers uh, taking decisions at 10, and then the lobby uh, at 11, um, quite apart from actually communicating with the troops about what they were meant to be doing. Um, and... Uh, that all worked, <laughs> but the moment I remember is that, as I say, uh, Margaret Thatcher had gone to Aspen, Colorado, and then she went and stayed with Widow Glover in Austria, or whatever she did, <clears throat> and uh, I cancelled my holiday, which I sorely needed. Uh, I managed to get, I think, the last week of it. Anyway, I came back at the end of that week. Margaret Thatcher had been back a week by then, and I walked into the cabinet room, and she said, oh, you're here. He said, uh, some of us have been working while you've been lying on the beach. <laughs> Not for the only time, I could have strangled her. <laughs> Very good. Right, Andrew, what's your favourite crisis? Crisis, I, uh, what I remember from my first time in, in uh, number 10, uh, the, the miners' strike, this was, uh, showed the cabinet officers at best, not simply in handling the crisis, but... After there was a threat of industrial action by the miners in 1982, Prime Minister wisely decided to pass at that point and not uh, rise to the challenge. And she said, but we must never let this happen again. And a lot of important work on resilience uh, led by the, uh, the Cabinet Office, and in particular the absolutely wonderful head of the unit at the time, Peter Gregson, uh, produced the plan about stockpiling coal and all the other things and how we would handle it. And of course, when the, uh, the challenge actually came in 1984, we were uh, as ready as we could possibly have been. And then uh, there was a, a committee which met several times a week, I think it was called MISC 21, people from the Department of Energy reporting on how many miners are working, how many are going back, state of coal stocks, production, etc., handling that crisis for almost exactly a year, and it eventually uh, was brought to a conclusion in March 85. So it shows that the benefit of the preparatory work for crises is absolutely at its best. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, does any crises happen on your watch? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, su I suppose the most, in the way, the most exciting, perhaps is the word I ought to use, um, was, the was the outbreak of the Falklands. Um, there was, uh, on the Thursday of that week, early in April, uh, I can remember the Prime Minister and some of her colleagues sitting around at the table in her room in the House of Commons, very gloomy about the Falklands. They had been invaded by the Argentinians, and how were we ever going to recover them or get the, get the Argentinians out of the, out of the place? And while they were all sitting there glooming, the first sea lord, Admiral Sir Henry Leach came into the room and he was in his full dress. He'd been to some important function and he was covered with scrambled egg. And um, he sat down at the table and uh, the Prime Minister told, told, said, sort of summed up and said where they were. And he said very quietly, Prime Minister, I can have a task force on the ocean on Monday. And if ever a remark transformed a situation, that was it. At first they didn't believe it, and then he convinced her that it was going to take a very long time to get to the Falklands anyway, um, and that uh, he could have the first vessels going out there, going out, starting out there on the Monday. And of course that transformed the situation, it transformed the mood. Uh, there was, uh, uh, and the decision was in effect taken that at that uh, early meeting, but it, it was it came to the cabinet the next morning on the Friday. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher was very careful on those big moments, always to make sure that the final decision was taken by the whole of the cabinet, so that she knew she had her colleagues fully behind her. And that was one of the most important cabinet meetings that I can remember when what was proposed was described and accepted. And then, of course, there was the debate in the House of Commons the next day on the Saturday. Um, so that were, and the whole period of the Falklands uh, was uh, f for me a great professional challenge because 
we had to run a, a war, an expedition to the South Atlantic and a war with the Argentines there, um, at the same time as really keeping the ordinary processes of civil government and e economic work going forward here. Um, so uh, we had a war cabinet which met every morning at half past ten or thereabouts with the five ministers who were members of that. The Chancellor was excluded from it uh, on the ground that you, he was going to have to find the money, whatever we did. Um, <laughs> the, and um, the, the preparations for that meeting involved um, a good deal of w work in the Ministry of Defence and the Cabinet Office and in the Foreign Office because we were, not only were we fighting an operation or doing an operation towards the South Atlantic, we were dealing with the, the American government, with, uh, with the Secretary of State, and, which was Hague and Al Hague, and of course with the United Nations where there was a lot, a lot going on. And we were marvelously well represented in, in Washington and in New York by Sir Nicholas Henderson and Sir Anthony Parsons. Um, but uh, so uh, the War Cabinet would meet at half past ten every morning, and after that, uh, the Chief of the Defence Staff and I would go back to my room in the Cabinet Office, summon the Head of the Foreign Office and the, the, head of the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence, and tell them exactly what had been decided and approved by ministers and commissioned the paperwork which would be needed for the meeting of ministers the next day. So it was a, it was a con continuous process. Um, that meeting that took place in my room after the war cabinets met um, was not a formal meeting. It became known as the Armstrong Group because I was very keen not to make it a full dress cabinet committee because I didn't want the Prime Minister and her colleagues to think that senior officials were second-guessing the decision of ministers in any formal sense. Um, and, but, but, but as well as doing that, we had to keep the, the, the regular administration going. That, I felt, laid a heavy burden on my colleagues, my Deputy Secretary and Under Secretary colleagues in the Cabinet Office to keep it going while that was while that process was going on. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the other crucial cabinet meeting in that time was when the decision was taken to land the troops on the Falklands. Um, it was of course the decision had to take account of military preparedness, uh, the availability of the right people in the right place and of the prospects for the weather because it's not great weather out in the Falklands in May and June. And um, so the War Cabinet, the five members of that, went across to the Ministry of Defence for a very full briefing by the soldiers and sailors, and then went back uh, to number 10 and formally discussed it and decided to recommend to Cabinet that we should go ahead and put the troops on shore and then there was a meeting of the cabinet to make sure that the whole of the cabinet was in, in line with that decision, was prepared to endorse that decision. Uh, once again, Margaret Thatcher was extremely keen, um, first of all, to that the plan should, as far as possible, minimize casualties, and secondly, that the whole of the cabinet should be behind it. Uh, and we had the meeting of the cabinet and it was approved and the signal was sent to the, to the landing to go ahead. An interesting contrast between the Falklands and the Gulf was that, of course, in the case of the Falklands, we were three hours ahead, and in the case of the Gulf, we were three hours behind. And four, hours, four, four hours, four hours in Falklands. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mattered, it mattered. We're going to come on to uh, cabinets, the, great, the greatest hits of our, our cabinets uh, in due course, but some great ones already. Uh, Gus, you can you catch mine? Just one point on this. I mean, you have to remember that as Cabinet Secretary, somebody comes to you every single day that there is a crisis, right? And, and you do need to learn that what Robert was talking about is a genuine crisis. And the, so the question I always used to put was how many people have died? 
Uh, because basically you'll get, well, the crisis is Secretary of State A has briefed against Secretary of State B. Or, you know, um, the Prime Minister and the crisis. Chancellor aren't entirely in agreement. Well, you know, these are not crises. For me, <laughs> Black Wednesday, when you're spending a billion dollars an hour, that counts as a crisis. Uh, you might have some difficult issues when you've got an unclear election result and you're not entirely sure where they're all going or... You know, you, your chancellor has gone missing at various points. Those are, you know, there are times when you've got crises, but mostly, I think to use a phrase that I, I first got from Andrew, a lot of what you do in the job is act as a shock absorber, not an amplifier. Yeah. But you did sit through the biggest international financial crisis yeah. in modern times. Exactly. So tell us that how that felt as cabinet secretary. Global financial crisis. Yeah, that was, I mean, when you look back on, which, which Terry, you and I did a lot of time, and you've brought in all the chairmen of the banks over the weekend, and all our banks are actually, number one, don't know. The chairmen don't know where they are. They go away, they come back, and they say, yes, you're right, we are going to be broke on Monday morning, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we can't survive. It looks a bit tricky. That, that genuinely counts as a crisis. And I think then you're in a world where you, you actually, again, you look back on precedents, and when there aren't any really like that, or at least they're a long way away and in a different world and technology's moved on, then you have to start being creative and you have to start thinking about, let's think about these things from first principles and let's see, you know, what were the mistakes made in the 30s? Uh, and then you get to a global world where you think this is not a financial crisis that's actually about the UK alone and you get to Gordon Brown, I think his finest hour, the G20, bringing everybody together, getting the world not to go down the route of protectionism. There's a lesson here. Uh, uh, and move towards a world where you cooperate to get through a very difficult patch. And you realize that actually you've been living with a world that was a lot more risky than you realize. Yeah, absolutely. Richard, you and I sat through uh, in different desks at 9-11. Yes. Was that your biggest crisis? I think uh, it was certainly, yeah, I think it was. Um, I, I was out at an official lunch, which I left early, got in the car, and the driver said, someone's um, flown a plane into the World Trade Center. And I said, oh dear, I hope that's an accident. And turn on the radio. And as we drove, they announced that the second plane had gone in. It clearly wasn't. Got stuck in traffic. Um, you rang me. Uh, and said you'd heard that the, we've both said this is serious, uh, we'd heard that the White House, you said, was going to evacuate, or was thinking about evacuating, should we evacuate number 10? So I said, um, if you evacuate number 10, where would you go to? Because I had this image of all the special advisors lined up on Whitehall with their laptops, <laughs> awaiting to be told where to go to. Uh, and you said, um, I'm not sure where we would go to. And I said, in that case, rule of like, do not evacuate until you know where you're going to. Let's, let's, go. <laughs> Let, let's stay where we are. And I got back quickly. That's why he's cabinet secretary. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and um, we decided, I, I mean, the immediate panic, not panic, fear, was that this is going to happen in the UK too. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, and I said, we must now ring up and talk to, and I will do a great lot of phone calls. We must have a cobra. We agreed we'd have a cobra at 4.30. And we've got to get hold of the prime minister who was about to address the TUC at Brighton with all his team. We had a conference call. And the thing which I'm, and they were very reluctant to take it, which you may not initially, because they want the, the speech as the thing. Uh, but we persuaded them that this actually was more important, that he, and, and I told him he'd got to come back. Uh, and um, the thing that was really interesting was that from the very first moment, I was saying, look, we've got to do all these following things. And he said, sure, sure. Uh, but where is Bush and how is he going to react and what is this going to do? He was absolutely into what he would call the big picture. So we've said to him, you've got to come back. Uh, we drew up a list, I drew up a list of all the people we had to be in touch with, beginning with the palace. Uh, I had images of planes flying down the mile into Buckingham Palace or going into Big Ben. All the targets, instantly, we rang up the speaker's office. Uh, we, uh, and then the real worry was the City of London Airport uh, and had long, uh, very rapid discussion in which I took an executive decision which to this day, I hope it's outside the statute of limitations. Anyway, I said, let's close it. We've just got to close the City of London Airport. We can't take the risk. Um, and we closed it. Uh, for, uh, anyway, 
and um, and we rang the security service. We rang uh, back in Paris. We got back various members of the royal family. We we tra we tra and the, in the middle of all this, the switchboard which had been newly installed in the cabinet office the previous weekend went down. <laughs> Uh, and the thing which you have to remember, in all, which I'd learnt in the storm in 87 when I was in charge of civil contingencies, was you had to have an outside line which is independent of any switchboard. If anyone ever deals with contingencies, it is rule number one. And we tried to get the civil contingencies unit back, but they were an easing world, bonding. Uh, <laughs> LAUGHTER We wanted to get the Overseas Defence Secretariat in to open up COBRA. They were in a coach on the way to Hereford to bond with the SAS. They were bonding. We had to make them got as far as Heathrow. We made them turn around. We, uh, I remembered we had a tunnel to MOD in case we needed to get people out quickly. The man in charge of the tunnel was on holiday and nobody knew where he'd left the key. Um, it was at the switchboard, as I say, went down. And in, but then, in the middle of all this, we had these key conversations, making sure the speaker knew what was going on. We got the security service. We had um, uh, 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 Richard Dearlove and, and his lot, SIS, active. We went through everything. And at 4.30, we had started COBRA. I was huge. I remember, I, it, it is like many of these things imprinted on my memory. One of the things that moved me, it was absolutely packed. Uh, I chaired it until we got the Prime Minister back. Uh, it was packed, and the people who were there were the people who'd been dealing with foot and mouth. It was extraordinary. They just knew in a couple of hours that they better just come, that something going on. And it was the most extraordinary meeting. All sorts of cabinet ministers. Gordon Brown turned up. I chaired. He said, you go on, you go on. And I was uh, chairing this meeting with cabinet ministers and people from uh, every part of Whitehall, at the standing room only. And we got a message then, I don't know what sort of time, 10 to 5, saying the Prime Minister was approaching. So I went up with two or three key people. We met the Prime Minister in his study. And he said, um, so where is, what, what, is, what is the impact of this going to be on the Americans? And I said, look, can we just deal with the things we've done? Because I wanted cover, because we'd done quite a number of things. We'd closed a lot of small airports. We'd, um, we'd upped the security Heathrow. We'd done all sorts of things simply off our bat, watching these towers collapsing on television in real time while we were doing it. It felt quite dramatic, it felt quite scary. And he kept saying, sure, you, ha you have my permission for all of that. Let's just talk about this. And we talked about the big picture. And we tried to get hold of the State Department uh, officials dealing with Afghanistan because it became clear that, I don't know how we knew, but we knew very rapidly it was Al-Qaeda. And the officials in the senior parts of the State Department who dealt with, uh, with Afghanistan, they, none of them had been appointed. Their appointments had not been confirmed in the new administration. So we had no one we could talk to in the State Department about what was going on. It was quite extraordinary. And then Mr. Blair came, uh, came down, and he took command, and, he, and we, I told him very briefly what we had done, and he said, that's fine, that's good. And then we talked about, and I remember Jack Straw saying, this is a moment of history. Uh, he, this, is, this is a historic moment, and this is actually it's going to change the world in important ways, and we all felt we, like, this feels true at the moment. And we discussed all the internal measures we've taken and whether there's more we should do. And then uh, Mr. Blair talked about the strategic issues, uh, and then we talked about uh, his need to send a message to Mr. Bush uh, and uh, to speak to Bush if he could, except Bush none knew where Bush was, if you remember, uh, which is like it was a, it was a kind of uh, issue there. Um, uh, and, and then we all went off to do all, all the things we'd agreed and we got a huge dossier of work going on what we knew about Afghanistan, what we knew about Al-Qaeda, all the relevant intelligence we could possibly get. Uh, and then we took it from there. It, 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 but it, I could go on at length, I mustn't, but it was quite a, it was, that was quite a striking day. I think look, the, the interesting thing is when you remember back to 9-11 or the Falklands or the miners' strike or the Gulf War, it just you know, when people say the civil service can't cope with the crisis, uh, a very topical issue at the moment, you just look back on some of the things we've had to deal with, sometimes simultaneously. Very interesting. I think we, without wishing to dumb this whole conversation down, I'm going to ask each panel member to try and look back on a cabinet that they remember that was the most important, the most exciting, the most dramatic, um, something, a cabinet meeting that stuck with them, because 
we've all, I think, said there's much more to being Cabinet Secretary than just simply sitting next to the Prime Minister in Cabinet and taking notes. But nevertheless, that is the irreducible core minimum of the job, as I've said before. So, Andrew, why don't you start? Well, I'm going to go back to um, sometime probably about 84, uh, when I was the Economic Affairs Private Secretary. Uh, we used to have a system of public expenditure control. You would agree a planning total at the start of the round. There'd be a series of bilateral negotiations, and those that weren't resolved bilaterally were referred to a thing called the Star Chamber, chaired by uh, Willie Whitelaw. And it turned out, of course, he was the only person who actually had the authority to make it happen. And when he left the scene, this thing fell into abeyance. And the only person who had not agreed was Patrick Jenkin, um, Secretary of the Environment. And he had two bids. And the cabinet, the whole cabinet, listened to his case. He wanted more money for social housing. I think he didn't get it, um, or as much as he wanted. And he wanted an increase in the EFL for the water industry. And everyone immediately said, look, you can have one of these, but you can't have both. And he said, well, it's got to be housing because it's immediate. And Ian Gow, the late Ian Gow, was the water minister at the time. And he said, we must never allow this to happen again. A water, a, an EFL of a major infrastructure organisation will never prevail in this kind of shootout and we've got to privatise it because the only way it's going to succeed. So the two things in this, one is that this illustrates a way of negotiating public expenditure which has long been confined to history and two, it was a point at which uh, the, the privatisation programme was given uh, an extra impetus. Mm, interesting. Robert, you've already given us a wonderful <coughs> vignette of uh, cabinets in the Falklands crisis, but anything else come to mind? Well, I, th 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 there was a great meeting of the cabinet during the Westland affair. Ah, yes. In <laughs> 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 and uh, there was this, there's, there's this disagreement about whether Westland should be rescued by uh, American company Sikorsky or uh, the, the, situa the solution which the Prime Minister favoured or whether it should become part of a European consortium with Augusta in Italy, uh, which was the solution that Michael Heseltine, who was of course Secretary of State for Defence, favoured. And uh, there's a lot of preliminaries, it's all in, in the history books in Charles Moore and all that. But um, uh, there was a break over Christmas, and then after Christmas, the, the Prime Minister decided that the rift, which had become very public, uh, must stop, and that uh, everybody's, any, any statement that any minister wanted to make about Westland would have to be cleared by the cabinet office, which didn't, which didn't mean me so much as her. <laughs> and um, this, Michael Heseltine accepted that any future statements would be, should be cleared in this way, but said he w wished to be free to repeat statements he'd made in the past and had been, were already, as it were, in the public domain. And the Prime Minister said, no, all, all statements, even those that have been made in the past, have got to be cleared in, if they're remade in the future. And Michael wouldn't accept this and the Prime Minister wouldn't, wouldn't accept anything else. And you could feel the tension rising and you could feel other members of the Cabinet intervening to try to find some way of easing the tension and preventing the crisis. But finally the Prime Minister summed up in her sense of it, that everything must be cleared by the Cabinet Office. And the, Michael Heseltine pulled his papers together on the table and said, in that case, Prime Minister, I can no longer remain in this Cabinet, and walked out. And none of us knew whether he was saying he couldn't stay in this meeting of the Cabinet. <laughs> or whether the thing was more drastic than that. And we were there for about two minutes, and then somebody came in from outside, said, Michael Hiltine is on the doorstep of number 10, saying he's resigned. And um, so we, uh, uh, we had uh, got to, I think, to item two in the cabinet business. <laughs> and there were three other items to come. So the cabinet was adjourned for half an hour, and um, some, some of us spoke to Sandringham and obtained the Queen's approval for the appointment of George Younger to be Secretary of State for Defence. He was Secretary of State for Scotland. And we sat down again for half an hour later with a new Secretary of State for Defence. <laughs>
So the front page of the Cabinet Minutes for this meeting is quite unique. It says, the Right Honourable Michael Heseltine, Secretary of State for Defence, items 1 and 2. <laughs> the Right Honourable George Younger, Secretary of State for Scotland, items 1 and 2. Secretary of State for Defence, items 3 to 5. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, Gus. Well, um, as exciting, a mem- number of mine I remember as exciting were uh, with other members of, uh, of the panel. So uh, the war cabinet that we had, uh, Robin mentioned the first Gulf War, when I think Andrew, you and Robin and I were all in there and uh, the mortar bomb landed just outside. So if that had been slightly more accurate, uh, you'd have had a, well, a different, <laughs> smaller or different panel. Yeah. Different. Um, <laughs> certainly different. Um, so there was that one. Also during that time, Maastricht, I remember John Major's uh, discussions, again, really interesting, actual real discussions about negotiating tactics for the Maastricht Treaty, real decisions made at Cabinet, which is, I think, as Robin was saying, quite rare that you get that sort of thing. For me, the kind of, the most important Cabinet in many ways, the Cabinet which virtually nothing happened, which was the first coalition Cabinet, because you've got the lions and the antelopes and you've taken down the wall and they're there, you know. And, and there's one big lot and one relatively small lot and you kind of wonder and you mix them up. They're not there by tribe. Suddenly these two tribes that spent their lives fighting each other are mixed around the table. Uh, Secretary of State for this or that. And actually, they all did the business. It all went on. It went very smoothly. And again, the cabinet meeting after they'd actually spent uh, weeks fighting each other in a referendum on the voting system. You know, that referendum where you have two clear outcomes, you know. Uh, very rare, that sort of thing. You know, you know what you're voting for. And um, <coughs> one side won, one side lost. And um, actually, they all came back together and, and they shared their toys. And it was great. Moving on. Can I have one thing on this question of the, uh, the mortar bomb? The person we should all thank was, was Nigel Wicks, who had begun a program of hardening the resilience of Number 10, including putting up the gates. But we had completed the uh, reglazing of the cameras. So those windows, they kind of crazed over like a kind of car crash windows, but they did not break. And the rest of us, uh, that's why we survived. Mm, thank you, Nigel. So, Richard. Well, as cabinets, I can remember... There are a lot of Mrs Thatcher's meetings where I sat at the end and wrote the minutes, including one where um, Paddy Mayhew reported on a terrible bomb in Northern Ireland. And just for a few minutes, the cabinet stopped being a political meeting and became a group of of men and women just sobered by the horror of what had happened. That's always stuck in my memory. Uh, Or... um, Endless Thatcher stories. Um, but for the Blair years when I was Cabinet Secretary, I have to admit to you, the really difficult thing is I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember some things, but nothing that fits your kind of label. Uh, they were tranquil days. Um, <laughs> well, that's one adjective. The thing which I perhaps, if I remember one, it is the um, Gordon Brown telling the cabinet what was in his budget. And the thing that was memorable about that occasion was that he spoke so fast that absolutely nobody understood or (laughs) let alone remembered a word that he said. It was completely unintelligible. He gabbled. I mean, more than gabbled. It was just 20 times the more speed of normal speech except that he suddenly slowed down and spilt out, as for the stupid, no more boom and bust, and then he speeded up again. (laughs) (laughs) Which is clearly the thing which he was going to hear. Um, And we had to go and ask his office to write the minutes because we had absolutely no (laughs) idea what he had said whatsoever. (laughs) Very good. Uh, Robin, your thunder's been stolen by many people. Well, no, I have not one, and that, of course, is the resignation cabinet of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and um, you remember on the eve of that when she met all the members of the cabinet individually and uh, they gave her their advice 
And she was also, she came back to number 10, extraordinary emotional resilience, and then sat in the cabinet room with some speechwriters and uh, started drafting his sp her speech for the confidence debate the next day. Uh, it wasn't absolutely clear that she was going to resign, but the writing was very obviously on the wall. And um, I asked myself how we were going to manage this at cabinet next day. And I sat at the principal private secretary's desk in uh, number 10 with the drafting team and Margaret Thatcher inside and um, I thought who she'll if she announces she's going to resign somebody's going to have to say something and uh, I thought who should that be and it, it obviously ought to be one of the people who'd be contenders for the succession because they'd elbow each other they don't want to do it and so I thought James Mackay is the ideal person and I drafted something for him to say and uh, discussed it with him during that evening, and he had it all ready for uh, the next morning. And then things took their course at the cabinet. She made her statement. Uh, James Mackay then came in and uh, said something. And it was the only time that I knowingly falsified the cabinet minutes, because she said something which was pretty well uncoded. I'm going but please don't appoint Michael Heseltine my successor. <laughs> <laughs> and I translated that into, I'm going, but I rely on my colleagues to carry on the mission to which we have been committed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's there to be seen somewhere. <laughs> At one point, she, she phoned me about eight and said she was resigning, so I phoned the palace. And then I went up there at nine o'clock, because for some reason we were starting early that day, and we walked down the stairs, and there was silence. And usually there's a great hubbub outside. I thought, was it 9.30? Anyway, we came around the corner, and there they all were, standing there, silent, looking at their shoes, you know, completely going kind to of change, and what on earth have we done? Um, and then off she went, but it, it turned out it was 9 o'clock after all. So I think we're almost out of time for the panel. Uh, we're going to get take some questions from the floor, but just remind, remembering why we're all here. It's the hundredth anniversary of the cabinet office this year, not just of the cabinet secretary. So can I just ask each member of the panel just to sum up very quickly, you know, no more than a minute. You know what is so important about the cabinet office? What's so good about the cabinet office? And you know why you've been proud to to lead it uh, in in your time. So who wants to start? Robert, why don't you kick off? One of, the, one of the important points about is, is geography and proximity is power. And the Cabinet Office started under Mount Morris Hankey in Richmond Terrace, across the Whitehall from Number 10. And then when I first came into, the, in, into government in 1950, the Cabinet Office was in the new public offices looking, overlooking Great George Street, and that was where Norman Brook was. Um, and then, uh, so that he and the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury, who was head of the Civil Service, were about equally distant from Number 10, and a walk down, a walk along Whitehall to get there. Um, in 1906, in 19, uh, end of 1960s, 1960, after the re reconstruction of Number 10 and the uh, Cabinet Office in 1973, the Cabinet Office moved into what had been the old Treasury. Uh, the Kent building overlooking the Horse, Horse Guards Parade with a communicating door to number 10. You didn't have to go out to, number, to get into number 10, there's a communicating door you can go through. And that meant that the Cabinet Secretary was literally 50 seconds walk from the Prime Minister undercover, uh, much closer to her, to him or her, in my case her, than any other civil servant uh, except her private office. Um, and I think that that proximity w was part of the reason why the Cabinet Office has developed as it has, uh, why the Cabinet Secretary becomes the head of the civil service. He's there on the spot, uh, with, within a stone's throw, literally, of, of, of number 10. Um, what was the other thing you would... Well, uh, just sum up in a word or two the importance of the Cabinet Office. Oh, yeah. So I think it, um, the other thing, of course, is that uh, other people have prime minister's departments, and there is a great reluctance in our system for there to be a prime minister's department. 
other ministers with their own departments very much resent the idea that there might be a Prime Minister's department which would be second-guessing them for, th for things for which they are responsible. And to some degree, the Cabinet Office has taken over the coordinating responsibility that might otherwise be with the Prime Minister's department, but is seen as serving the government of the Cabinet as a whole and not as the Prime Minister's instrument. And I think that's also been quite important in the way in which it has developed as the, the central system in government. Correct. Robin. Well, just taking on from there, I absolutely agree with Robert. I always thought it was really important that the Cabinet Office was neutral as regards policy. It was a processing department. It wasn't a designed to achieve any result, and only thus would it have the confidence of the competing uh, departments under the Prime Minister. I would say the Cabinet Office did, did these things. It untangles knots so that, uh, that you can see the issues clearly when ministers uh, come to decide. It transmits instructions to the rest of Whitehall, what Robert described as being the chief engineer in the, uh, in, in the ship of uh, state. And um, what was the third? Um, it, uh, it, it, at times, is the co executive, coordinating executive for uh, government of which a good example, Jeremy, is what you must be having to do on Brexit. Exactly. We don't have any views on that. We just coordinate. Richard? I, I, I think both uh, Robert and Robin have spoken very well, and uh, I absolutely uh, support and agree with what they said. I think it's about good government or supporting good government. I think we have a system of collective responsibility, and I think exactly as Robin said, it's very important uh, to have a body uh, uh, which supports ministers collectively and the Prime Minister as chair of ministers collectively. Um, if you follow the correct due processes, it's no guarantee that decisions are going to be good decisions. Nothing can protect ministers from a bad decision. And you can, you, I can think of all sorts of things, which perhaps the community charge or the poll tax is the most obvious example, where you went through every process absolutely brilliantly and got the decision wrong. Uh, but it gives you the best chance of getting a good decision. Uh, it gives you the best chance, if you have a lot of brains from different points of view, departmental points of view, applied to a problem, that you, look, you don't overlook some angle or fall into the trap of having too many like-minded people discussing the problem and excluding those who might disagree. Uh, it's a check on power. Uh, it is fundamentally about balancing power within, uh, uh, within the centre of government. Uh, and I think the Cabinet Office is an absolutely crucial uh, institution from the point of view of supporting good government. Brilliant. Andrew? I think at the top of any organisation there, uh, um, there have to be three things and they have to be brought together. One is giving direction to the business of the organisation, well it does. The other is to develop the resources, which could be people or it could be the structures in which people operate. And the third is to set a culture an ethical framework in which it operates, and the Cabinet <coughs> Office does all three of those, and they should all stay together. Brilliant. Gus? In addition to all, which I agree with, um, transitions, uh, being there when uh, governments change, and being there when prime ministers change. I mean, we heard about problems in America. Uh, I saw exactly the same global financial crisis. Who knows what will happen in the next few months? You know, that gap in the US when the, the officials just aren't there. And the Cabinet Office, I think, does that transition incredibly quickly. And I think that's part, in addition to the coordination work. The other point I say is it has uh, been a hub of innovation at different times. So I'd say behavioural insights team, uh, some of the digital stuff you've been social doing, exclusion. social exclusion unit, you know, there'd be various things where, if you like, it's kind of infant industry thing. Quite often it, it starts there uh, and then it uh, tries out an idea and if it works it translates out and goes into the departments. Brilliant. So, Bronwyn, I hope that's been entertaining, informative, relevant. And now over to you. Jeremy, and all of you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for that um, marvellous slice of recent history and the memories and good humour of that and even the mischief of it. Um, thank you. We're going to go to questions now. There's going to be a lot. Let me move over so that I don't block your view of the panellists. Um, who would like to kick off? Um, Right, here in the front. I'm going to take two at a time because and panelists must pick what they want. 
Uh, two questions. Firstly, um, right at the beginning, in terms of pre preparing yourself to be Cabinet Secretary, I noticed only Jeremy has worked outside the civil service in the private sector. Do you think that would be a, a, a good thing for your successors? And a more substantial question, we are led to believe that the, Mr. Cameron instructed you, Jeremy, not to prepare, do any preparatory work for Brexit. Um, do you think that the Cabinet Secretary has some sort of uh, function beyond serving the government of the day to some sort of constitutional duty or public interest duty? Uh, I noticed that the Bank of England didn't obey that instruction and perhaps others didn't as well. Thank you. Would you like to identify yourself for the record? I'm sorry. I'm Andrew Kahn. I'm a trustee here at the uh, Institute for Government and I was in the Cabinet Office for about seven years. Fantastic. And let me take another one um, right, right at the back uh, there. Uh, thank you. Ian Corby. Um, I believe at least five of you have worked with a Prime Minister who's had a Chief of Staff and one of you has two Chiefs of Staff. I wonder how that development has impacted on the office that you held. Great. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to kick off? Not me. No one has <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Uh, first of all, I mean, I think all experience is uh, relevant, and I think some outside experience. I mean, one of the things that in recent years we've tried to do is to give the rising people in the civil service some experience outside it, and that's a great help. I would say more important, actually, is to work in a wide range of government departments, particularly at the uh, front end. Now, <laughs> it's quite a, quite a firm rebuff then to the, this idea of commercial experience coming in. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I think mean, others may disagree with me, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it, it's it's valuable for people who are going to be senior civil servants in any department that there should be that they should have an element of outside experience. But I think that for the cabinet secretary. It's um, a profound knowledge of Whitehall, which is, uh, of, of the government in Whitehall, which is the key, the first key to the thing. Um, Robin and I both came from the Treasury. Um, I, I had had four years in the Home Office, uh, so that I had exp experience of other departments. And in a sense, I think that would have been more important than any outside experience would have been for, for, for this particular job. Can I controversially turn your question the other way around? Um, I've had, since I left the uh, civil service, I've had 10 years on the board of a FTSE 100 company, and I've been chairman of a bank with um, eight partners carrying unlimited liability. The, the FTSE 100 company had the Murdochs in minority shareholders. I have found the skills I learned as a cabinet secretary and as a civil servant enormously helpful in the private <laughs> sector. If you see your shareholders, as your ministers, uh, and if you bring to them the skills of a permanent secretary, that really, really is valuable. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, the chief of staff question. Uh, first of all, there was David Wolfson, I think, carried that title. It was completely meaningless. He was simply a political ally and a fundraiser. He, and he did not interfere one iota in the business of uh, government. Uh, more controversially would be uh, Jonathan Powell, who famously said the uh, Cabinet Secretary wishes to be the principal advisor of the Prime Minister, but often the Prime Minister doesn't want that. And I think he made it his business to make sure that uh, uh, that relationship, certainly in my case, that my relationship with Tony Blair never flourished, partly because there was an attitude there that they wanted me when they needed me, but otherwise uh, they would uh, try to run things to themselves. Um, i trying to think who the other... Did you someone mention there were three other chiefs of staff? Uh, no, yeah. no, I think all five, yeah. five people have chiefs of staff, and one of you's got two. Mm. And in fact, I think Sir Jeremy, you have been a chief of staff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't actually. That was, always, that was a mistake in whichever biography it was. I've never been a chief of staff. <laughs> Like I've worked with uh, with all three of the real chiefs of staff, uh, uh, including the joint chiefs of staff at the moment, and I think it really just very much depends on the working relationship you've got with them. Um, I mean, in each case, I've found it relatively straightforward to work with them. They are the chief political advisor. They they manage, in some sense, the special advisors inside Number Ten, and I think that function is a perfectly legitimate one. Um, I think it would become a problem if it got in the way of the cabinet secretary and the civil servants in Number Ten.
having direct access to the Prime Minister and be able to put exactly the advice they want to put into the Prime Minister. I think if you ever get into a situation where the civil service is so cowed that it can't put its own advice forward, unadulterated, then I think you've got a problem. That's not been my experience. Um, but you know, I think it's very, very important that the political side of the, of, the num of the number 10 operation and the civil service side work hand in hand in a cooperative way to the joint boss, as it were. And that has been my experience, I'm happy to say. Uh, and therefore, I don't have a problem with the, issue, with, with, with the role. But it's obviously something you'd have to be careful about. I, if I may just, mm. just having worked alongside both Jeremy and Jonathan Powell, say that I think Jeremy was class act in managing that, because Jeremy was also a principal private secretary doing a lot of deals, also managing the relationship with Gordon Brown and um, doing deals with that chap from Quickly Come Dancing. Um, <laughs> I, I thought I got on fine with the chief of staff, Jer Jonathan Powell, until years later I read the Campbell Diaries and uh, Jonathan Powell's books and discovered I didn't. Um, <laughs> I, I had the same experience. But can I just take, a, <coughs> can I just take uh, Andrew's second question, which I think is a really interesting one. To what extent is there a duty to prepare for things that the government will not authorise you to prepare for? Mm -hmm. Now, Jeremy definitely oughtn't to be asked to comment on this. But I think these days it is really difficult that mm -hmm. because um, I think all of us would feel, yes, we've got to think about that. But in these days of leaks and so on, uh, for, to be, for a leak, you know, the cabinet sector was preparing for a result that the government was not uh, envisaging and, uh, and hadn't authorised any work to be done on, uh, you would be in trouble. Uh, so uh, I think if I'd been you know, there before the referendum, I would have felt a duty to be thinking about it and perhaps some, have some very confidential discussions with people I could trust. But I think it's jolly difficult to go beyond that. Could be. Can I just yeah, absolutely. So in the, in the cabinet manual, we, we, we lay down in black and white what happens pre-elections, and we've got a standard thing. Of, uh, curious enough, the incumbent government doesn't like the idea of it not winning, uh, but we do plan and have done, all of us, for uh, various scenarios post-election uh, during election periods. So I think one could imagine a circumstance where if you could get all party support, for uh, just having a convention. If you're going into a referendum, the, the, and, and you, you, only, you can only do this for the future, I think, to say that the civil service, when we hit the PERDA period, post that PERDA period, the civil service will then do contingency work for all possible outcomes. Who could argue with that? Can I, can I just, I mean, I'm not going to comment on the philosophical question, but um, uh, just to clarify what actually happened on this one. Fortunately, no, Parliament had had actually insisted that the government produce various documents uh, relating to alternatives to membership. So there's a fair amount of work that could be done that came in very handy, frankly, uh, which Parliament had explicitly required, the House of Lords, I think, uh, required that to be done. Um, I don't know whether it was this eventuality in mind, but it was definitely helpful that in the public domain there was a request for the civil service and the government to do some work on things which were highly relevant to the eventuality that we might end up leaving. So that was all very clear. Uh, the Prime Minister, you know, this has been sort of overinterpreted in a sense, I, I think the area that he would not have uh, favoured, didn't favour, was that the civil service in the period of Perda should have explicit contacts with the other side of the referendum. Um, but, so that, that there wasn't, in the, in the same way as this guy just said, during, during the period in the run-up to an election, there was an explicitly sanctioned conversation allowed between the civil service and the leader of the opposition and sh shadow secretaries of state. And that is useful. Everybody accepts that's useful. We didn't go as far in this referendum period as to say there should be, you know, an official leave spokesperson or spokespeople and that, that group of people should speak to the civil service and plan. We didn't go that far. And so people can have different views about that. But that still left quite a bit of space between what was explicitly authorised, which was the, the documents that we were told by Parliament to produce, and what was clearly off limits. And I don't think it was wrong in any, any shape or form for me to exploit that space and do some confidential thinking, as Robin has suggested. And I think uh, that's what we did. Uh, I don't think the Prime Minister would have been angry about it if he'd discovered about it. I, I didn't discuss it with him because you know, he was out campaigning. That was, that was what he was doing.
Uh, and I think that's, that's struck the right balance on this one. But it's perfectly reasonable, in my view, to have a debate about these things. And if we ever have a sort of huge national debate or referendum on something like this again, it's good to have had the debate in advance because it's very difficult to change the rules halfway through in the white heat of the, of the campaign. It's much better to have thought these things through in advance. Thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, we've got a couple here near the front, and then I'm uh, coming further back. One here and one on the aisle. Thank you. Catherine Haddon uh, from the Institute of Government. Um, thank you again for all being here. However, one of, the questions, uh, one, of, one of the questions that was put to me when we sent the invitation out was, why have you got an all-male panel? So I'd like to put that question to you. Were there any women during your respective eras you think would have been a marvellous Cabinet Secretary, and what are the prospects for the future? Thank you. And then straight, straight behind here on the aisle. Thank you. George Jones, LSE. I think you're all agreed that the Cabinet Secretary should also be the uh, official head of the Home Civil Service. Is that because, as Cabinet Secretary, you're so well placed to protect and promote the interests of the Civil Service? Thank you. Two provocative questions. Well, on the gender issue, um, I mean, I agree. I mean, it's um, very frustrating that we haven't had uh, a female cabinet secretary yet or female head of the civil service. It will be one of my key objectives in life that when I come to be replaced, there will be a short list which has at least one and hopefully a balance of uh, applicants. Um, it is what it is. I think I've been uh, involved in the appointment of about a third of the number of female permanent secretaries ever uh, invented, uh, if that's the right word. Uh, Gus at one point had about 50-50 in the permanent secretary group, but you need to build a long sustained pipeline here. 40% of the senior civil service is now women, which is an extraordinary number compared to where we were even 20 years ago, and compared to what other organizations in Britain can boast. So I think that shows we've got now real strength and depth, 40% of the entire civil service, senior civil service, 50% of the civil service. Uh, and on the back of that overall number, I'm very, very hopeful that you know, it will just become no longer a talking point within 10 years, and we will have 50-50-ish and therefore you would fully expect over time to have a female cabinet secretary and head of the civil service. That obviously must be our aim. And, I mean, just remember, the civil service um, was absolutely in the van of having per female permanent secretaries. Alex Mainel, um, uh, Evelyn Sharp, um, uh, Muriel Rilsdall, you know, I mean, one of the first, really one of the first organisations that did that. And any point on the second question there to represent the civil service? To protect, to protect it. To protect it. Well, I don't think we do that beyond, beyond what is reasonable. Um, uh, <laughs> I do so think it's important, I think it's significant that uh, the head of the civil service and the cabinet secretary are now conjoined. Um, and that's partly because uh, uh, the head of the, the cabinet secretary is the civil servant who has the most opportunities to see the, and talk to the Prime Minister, much more than any other permanent secretary in, in Whitehall or around. Um, a head of the civil service, wherever he is, is going to be less able than the chief of the defence staff or a head of some professional organisation to publicly uh, re represent his his, uh, his flock, but uh, the head of the, the secretary of the cabinet has the advantage of being able to represent uh, the interests of the civil service to the prime minister privately, um, and that is quite an important thing. I, I remember having a, when I was cabinet secretary having a very interesting conversation with Douglas Allen, who'd been head of the civil service in the civil service department who spoke passionately about how much better it was to have the two posts united because, he, because of this point about access that Robert Armstrong has just outlined to you. Because uh, he felt that, it, that he simply did not have the access. He'd put something forward and the Prime Minister would end up talking to the Cabinet Secretary about it. The, um, and, and, and on the women, can I just say, I had, I, I, like my colleagues, a real drive to try to improve the uh, representation of women on merit in the senior civil service. And I think it went up from something like 17% to 27 in my time. But I was always frustrated by the fact that a lot of really, quite often, good women did not put their names forward. 
And we did research into it, uh, and it's, it was very interesting results. But one key thing that came out is a very strong statement. These are jobs designed by men for men. We don't want them in that form. I just leave that form. Thank you. I mean, the, the diversity, thing, I think we all strongly agree with that, but yeah. it's much broader than women. This is the first point to make. Uh, the, se the second point on the, your question about, think about what, what you, the Cabinet Secretary and the Prime Minister are trying to do, which is actually make the world a better place. A vast amount of what government does is via public services. A vast amount is delivered by public service, not entirely. Actually, what all of this group have in common, uh, the long-run trend is a reduction in the size of our civil service. And, and over the last 30-odd years, uh, a big increase. Uh, Andrew talked about EFLs, you know, external financing limits for the water industry. Well, the water industry is not in the public sector anymore. You know, vast amount of this has now gone to the private sector in terms of regulated industry. So, but it's still absolutely crucial that the Prime Minister has beside him not just a cabinet secretary advisors on policy but a head of the civil service can talk about the effectiveness of the civil service and what they need to make these things work for the public or beside her oh, indeed right um, she to she hopefully um, one here yeah, uh, Peter Riddle, former, in, in this capacity, former director of the Institute for Government. <laughs> Can I uh, take up something Robert Armstrong said, uh, that he was the last person just to have a phone on his desk. And I just wondered what the reflections were in that period of uh, 30 years, the impact of uh, the arrival of emails, social media, 24-hour news, both internally and externally on the way you all did your jobs, because it was changing throughout the period of, 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 of post-Robert, um, and it's clearly altered the context and the space in which you can operate. Thank you. Uh, another, another one here, and I'm going to take a third and sadly last one, because we're going to have to end um, essentially on... Uh, Sue Street, a former civil servant and of I think I've worked for all of you in different capacities over the years. Um, the three qualities I take away that I see from all of you are wit, integrity, and fairness. And I think that, that sort of qualifies you for these roles. Um, and you have, I think, understated your individual roles as the line managers of permanent secretaries, which mm -hmm. can make a huge difference. And, as a woman, I think going up the pipeline, uh, even though I was very junior, for example, when Robert and Robin were in their posts, I still felt that I had been noticed and um, supported. So I thank you for that. Uh, but there is a but. For those who think that the civil service needs to change, and this is not a point about women or ethnic or other diversity, do you, do you really believe that we need a fresh view, a change, a more emphasis on delivery, more commercial? All these things that have been said over so many years aren't actually happening, and I'm not sure whether any of you really believe that it needs to change um, in combination with the pride of all that's been achieved so far. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And let me take a third one here on the aisle. And real apologies to those... Um, asking at the back. I'm sorry, we're very short of time. Hi, um, thank you. I enjoyed your talks very much. Um, Emma Downey from the House of Commons Library. I just wondered um, if a Prime Minister should avoid suspending collective responsibility at all costs or whether sometimes having an agreement to differ is a wise choice. <laughs> Great, thank you very much indeed for that. Ah, that last one, three good questions. A digital age uh, agenda again and re relationship with the I, Prime Minister. I can respond to, well, thank you Sue for her uh, comments, um, but I will dispute this question about uh, change. The idea that the civil service hasn't changed, it's changed enormously. It's about half the size it was when I came in for a start. Its coverage is completely different. Its style of, of uh, organising, it is much less um, much less stratified, much less formal, and as well as, as well as the gender diversity, there are lots of people who did not start life in the civil service, and they have managed to get to the to the top. Uh, it has embraced technology. Um, 
and it's had its failures, but so too have all sorts of people in the public and the private sector. So the idea that it's, it is still the same old civil service, I just think it's completely wrong. Um, and it has, it develops, it doesn't do so, partly because it is a very large organisation, it doesn't do so by a huge heave, it does it by uh, incrementally, and the important thing is that, that there is always some or some elements of reform on the agenda, rather than looking for the big solution or the big change. And on that basis, I think you'll find a whole series of initiatives that you can follow uh, all the way through. I just come in behind that on outcomes. Um, I mean, you know, I, I remember from Next Steps, there were all sorts of respects in which the uh, chief executives were given goals of uh, improving services and they improved them. And I believe, you know, that the quality of services has improved hugely from um, 20 years ago. Of course, then, there are things that go wrong now. I mean, two problems that are not successfully dealt with. But I don't think that should suggest that there's been no improvement. There will always be failures. These two points about, I mean, important points about the digital age and, uh, and indeed about relationships to the Prime Minister. Can I talk about the digital age briefly? Um, I think Robert's uh, claim I would challenge. Uh, I think I was the last one to have yeah. just telephones on my desk because I think Andrew had a screen. Uh, I, um, we it's extraordinary how recent it is. We introduced emails into the Cabinet Office of Number 10 at the, it, and it was your drive. It, 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 at the beginning of um, 1998 is my memory. Uh, and I was still operating paper-based, my boxes are paper-based. If there was an email that was relevant, I had a hard copy in my box. Um, and and uh, mobile phones were still pretty much um, half bricks. Uh, with really smartphones really are relevant, uh, new of the last decade or so. It's just very hard to, to remember that. The difference it makes is one that I think um, Jeremy was best placed to answer, but I suspect, or Gus, is, I suspect that um, historians are going to find it much harder to track how something was done when there isn't a submission done on four sides of blue, sink, one and a half spaced, uh, which you can read with a response from number 10 when it's done in an exchange backwards and forwards. Mm. Uh, and I think that's, that's one difference. Uh, but equally, the pace of media pressure on governments to take decisions makes it much more difficult to manage the process of decision making when you're in the glare of publicity and the social media on you. And the pressure of social media on governments and the way that something can go viral in no time at all is another pressure. I think it's altered hugely, but I'd say it was a product of the last decade almost. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you for that. I think that is the force of Peter's question. Yeah. In the 1990s, uh, John, as John Major's press secretary, I carried around one of those bricks. Yes. And they lasted for about 20 minutes, yes. right? Huge battery of a phone. And I remember being with him when, in Colombia, having to give an interview uh, because uh, there was a report on the wires that he died. Uh, we crashed. So we did an interview live. It seemed to solve the problem. But, um, <laughs> the... the uh, the part I think people need to realise that an added dimension to the job has been that in the old days you go before a select committee and there'd be a lot of journalists writing it up. Nowadays it's all televised. So you become known, so you become a public figure. And the ability to just be, uh, as it were, heard and not seen is impossible nowadays. So there is a requirement for a bigger public profile for all cabinet secretaries. It's forced on them whether they want it or not. And we do have to operate in a world where people are getting their news and media from all sorts of different places. So you do need to understand that presentation inevitably becomes bigger and the 24-7 media inevitably reinforce that terrible element of it's a crisis and you have to spend your time kind of calming things down. Mm. Yeah, I mean, first of all, on the digital thing, I mean, it is breathtakingly different from when I joined the civil service in 1983, whenever it was. I mean, the pace of work is just, you know, night and day. I mean, I remember sending stuff down to the Treasury typing pool and not expecting to get it back for sort of several <laughs> days. And then that didn't really matter. And then it would go through a hierarchy of people. Uh, you know, Gus was my first, I think, uh, 
boss actually. Um, probably micromanage me. You know. But you know, even, even, if, even if I managed to go through Gust, I'd have at least four more layers to get it through to the Chancellor's Exchequer. And it didn't always work like that, of course. But in large parts of the Treasury, you would you would have to go through several different layers of management, all of whom would put cover notes on uh, or would redraft your work. They would ponderously go back down to the typing pool and come back. That sort of stuff happens inside like half an hour now with 15 people, no matter how junior, sort of weighing in to the Cabinet Secretary's email sort of with a point of view. Yeah, it's a far flatter, far flatter organisation, much more rapid, uh, much less tolerance in press officers and prime minister's officers for, you know, we'll come back to you tomorrow on that subject. You know, you've got a media agenda and, and so on. Now, we might wish it wasn't like this, but this is how it is. And the civil service now is totally different from how it was in the 1980s, totally different, I would say, even from the 1990s. It is breathtakingly rapid, it's much more short term. And you try as we might to carve out time, you know, months, weeks to sort of take an issue offline. It is really difficult. We do try and do that, of course, but it is really just the pace of work. And Rich is totally right. Actually, the records is one of the biggest problems we've got. I mean, an issue that comes to the permanent secretary's table probably two or three times a year is how on earth we repair the damage to our public records that took place when we didn't pro have proper protocols in place when email f gradually took over. It is a total mess. Philip Rycroft, the permanent secretary I put in charge of this thankless task, calls it the pile. You know, we've got a pile of stuff somewhere, and we've got to painstakingly reassemble it for the public record. Which I mean, I'm very committed. I'm a historian. I'm very committed to that. So there's a definitely a, a knowledge management, knowledge retrieval issue, uh, and then there's a sort of pace of work issue, which is absolutely enormous. But uh, you know, and thank you again for, for your for your comments, Sue. But I'm I'm somewhat disheartened to think that your perception is that nothing has changed because you know anybody who looks at the digital services that we, now we offer that looks at the quality of our commercial people, that looks at the quality of our project management and the effort we now put into putting people through world-class project management courses and so on, would, I think, be bound to conclude on any fair-minded assessment the civil service is far different from where it was years ago. And we've always been really good at policy stuff, negotiation, yeah. advising ministers, doing comms, getting bills through parliament and so on. But I, I now think we are amongst the best employers in the country on commercial, definitely on digital, Project management, we've got nothing to learn from the private sector in my view now. I think we are as good uh, as the best in the private sector. And that's because we've taken a lot of good people in and we've trained our own people and we've put people through courses and so on. So I think we are, we're not just sort of talking about this, we are actually delivering major change on the ground and I'm extremely proud of what we've, we've done. And it's, I'm you know, standing on the, on the shoulders of giants as they say. So it's, it's the labor of many people over many years putting this agenda forward, but it absolutely is the case that we are far more efficient, far more productive, far more effective than we were two or three decades, two or three decades ago. On that note, we're, we're going to have to end. We have only one dangling question, which is relationships with the Prime Ministers, but the panel will be spared that and the audience deprived of that, but because we do have to end. Thank you all very, very much for coming and for your questions. I'm sorry about the temperature in the room, and thank you very much, Jeremy Hayward.